Let's read again this part of this Christmas story, and I want to focus today on the peace of God. It's been talked about already, and God taking our mess, and yeah, children, you be dismissed. We're going to do the offering here in a little bit. Thank you. I like that. I like that. Thank you, my brother. Hey, Caleb, would you turn uh, the bass down, please, on my mic? Make my, make my hair stand up if you... Amen. Still in there. There you go. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> Jonathan, got them slides going there, brother? Amen, amen. Somebody read Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Who's got that in there? I know it's up here, but let's, let's read it. Okay, let's say that again one more time while everybody's listening. Okay. Peace to men, to those whom God is well pleased. Let me ask you a question this morning and, and, and just, is God pleased with you? Is that a fair question? Is God pleased with you? I, I love the season. I love Christmas and and, and just the giving time and the rejoicing time and uh, the generosity that just seems to fill the air at this time. Oh, D.D., it's so good to see you today, hon. Praise the Lord. Good to see y'all today. Chris, Christopher, blessings. All the way from Dallas. Euless, right? Y'all home, is it Euless particular, isn't it? Praise God. Give them a, a good welcome. Thank you for being here again. Amen, amen, amen. Looked out there and saw your pretty face. But to celebrate Christmas and not worship him is a real I don't know, it's a dichotomy. It's something that you know, we get caught up in the the, the hustle and and, and celebrating gift giving and we can celebrate what we're doing we're celebrating a day we're celebrating a, an historical figure or we're celebrating a personal savior Does that makes sense and if we're just celebrating an historical fact it's almost like it's a Slap in his face? A disgrace? Do you see what I'm saying? Because he came not to be celebrated as a baby and kind of lauded over. and he, he came to be crowned king of kings. He came to be received as Lord and Savior. He came to redeem you. Amen? And rescue you from our sin. Why did he come? The primary reason is because we needed a Savior. Amen? The overarching reason is because we needed a Savior. And Jesus is our Redeemer, our Savior. And to celebrate Christmas and not celebrate him as our Savior is a real disservice at the very least. Do you follow what I'm saying? And it seems to, to kind of bother me more and more every year. And, and I think we can do both. I mean, we can do the Christmas and celebrate this season and, and rejoice in that and partake in that. But if we don't receive him, 
It's like, what's the use? You get me? Why bother? It's almost sacrilegious. That's, that's the word I'm thinking. It's kind of sacrilegious. You've got all this celebrating going on, and we can do this all day. And if he's not your Savior, why? It's just pageantry. It's just... Mm. Let's pray right now. This Lord, I pray this season, this Friday, Christmas Day, God, that you would arrest those who are just celebrating an historical fact, a day, and not really personally receiving him for why he came. Pray that you'll touch people's hearts. Touch our hearts, Lord. Touch our families. Touch our children. Touch our friends and our neighbors. God, what if we really made this day about him? Oh, what a difference. God, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. That you get a hold of us, Lord. And God, our celebration will be marked, God, by us giving ourselves to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's listen to what the angels said. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is well pleased. Now, peace is something that we have when our life is not in pieces. If you, how do you know if I have peace? Well, if, you're, if your life is in chaos and, and, and it's divided and it's, it's torn to pieces, then you don't have peace. And that's why Jesus says, I have came to unite. Literally speaking, the word peace in the New Testament means to make one, to join together, to take that which has been separated and put it together. I mean, know oh, your life has been separated. People, there's lives that are in fragmented, they're in chaos, there's so much division and, and discourse and and, and tragedy in our life. God wants to put our lives together. And the only way that your life can ever come together in one piece so that you can have his peace is through his presence. I believe that your life will always be shattered, fragmented, unless Jesus Put you together. Lucy and I love to put puzzles together. Lucy loves to put puzzles together. And I just like being Papa. I really don't like puzzles. But her, her famous saying is sometimes we'll get it and it won't work, it won't work. And I said, oh, man. She said, just, just calm down, Papa. And she put these hands up there. I, I can see Emily do it. Emily says she don't do this. But how many of we do things subconsciously that we don't realize to do? And so, I mean, where else did she get it? Emily said, I don't do that. Emily, she learned it from you. Well, now that'll preach, won't it? And so she's like, when the puzzle pieces don't go together and I get a little bit mm, perturbed, or especially when we're building a tower and that thing fell, and I said, oh, man. Papa. Papa. She looks at you right now. Look, look at me. Can't you see, Emily? Look at me. This is what she said. Look at my eyes. Lucy, look at my eyes. Calm down, Papa. And you know what she says? It's going to be all right. Can I tell you today? Look at him. Look, he, that's what Jesus is saying. He's the Prince of Peace. Look, look at me. Look at me. Look, look at my eyes. You know, you can really discern what a person is. What if you look at their eyes. Eyes are telling. They're the light of the body. And in a person's eyes, you can discern. And in his eyes, you see, you, you sense his love. Look at me. Now, I'm the one that should be telling her to calm down. 
You know, it seems like a little bit of a role reversal there. But Jesus is looking at our chaos, and boy, peace is something that we really, boy, don't we need peace today? We long for peace. People strive for peace. People long for peace. People die for peace. It seems so evasive, but really peace is invasive. Because if you let Jesus invade your life, then you will be filled with peace. I'm going to talk about peace more next week. But for a few minutes, I want to talk about pleasing him. How do you get peace, Pastor? You simply please God. I submit to you today, if you're pleasing God, you know, peace to those whom God is well pleased. You hear me? Peace. Lord God in us in peace to men who are well pleasing to God. Think about that for a moment. Here in 1 John 3 22, whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and we do what pleases Him. Now, there is a degree that God, uh, the grace of God and the favor of God is on us regardless. Amen? May, it's something that is undeserved. It's unmerited. In other words, we don't have God's grace because we deserve it. Can I hear an amen? amen. Well, if you think you deserve God's grace, you're really in trouble. Because <laughs> you deserve hell. Hallelujah. That's right. That might not have been a good place to say hallelujah. <laughs> oh, me. But I'm, I'm telling you, listen, if you don't understand that truth, you'll never appreciate the almighty, amazing grace of God. Because if you think you deserve something less than the burning hell the rest of your eternal life, then you never really grasp the love. Because he gives you his grace and what you don't deserve instead of giving you what you do deserve. And so if you don't understand the penalty that we deserve, that he spared us from, and the debt that he paid, then you never appreciate that payment. So there is a measure of the favor and the grace of God that, that we do not deserve. But I also believe the scripture teaches us that the way we behave and the way we act and the way we walk and the way we talk, just like a father is pleased because their children, you know, walk in the truth and they're doing things the right way, they're acting the right way. We either pleasing God or we're not in that sense. It's like righteousness. There's an imputed righteousness that God gives to us. We are righteous because he hath made us righteous. Not because we live righteously. Amen? Hear me. The scripture says, I am the righteousness of God. He hath made us to be woo, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He imputed that to us. He said, here is my cloth of righteousness. Put this on, Pastor. Put this on, Donnie. Now you are right with God. Not because of anything you've done or ever could do or ever would do, but simply because you received what Jesus did, you are righteous in his eyes. Merry Christmas. Oh, I love that. Then there's a practical righteousness. That he works in us. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And so because his righteousness is working in us, I mean, we're transformed from the inside out and we become more and more like him. And guess what? We begin to act like him. How many of you lived a way where you're acting more like Jesus now than you were a year ago? Maybe a day ago. 
a week, six, whatever. Amen? This progressive, I believe in progressive sanctification. That we are transformed day by day from glory to glory, and we are becoming more and more like him. It's the caterpillars. The metamorphosis is taking place, and we are becoming who God knows we already are. If we just submit to him, he works in us, and we'll see that to be the case in the Scripture. And so that's that imputed righteousness, but there's also the practical righteousness. I have to make decisions, choices every day. Am I going to walk in the Spirit? Am I going to act in such a way that pleases God? Y'all follow me? And so just like my Anna and Emily growing up, they did not always please. I mean, they're, they're PKs, and I know y'all think they were just angels growing up, and we never had any problems with them. They just always obeyed because it's the pastor's home, and, you know, everything just flies around, and we walk, you know. Hey, that's right, Miss Val. No, they disobeyed. They rebelled. I mean rebelled, I mean rolled their eyes, I mean turned up their nose, I mean despised daddy, despised mama, did exactly what we told them not to do. And guess what, was I happy about that? Was I pleased with their bad behavior? No, and neither is your heavenly father. But he doesn't love you any less, does he? See, that's the beauty. Now, I didn't, I didn't, and now, if we're good parents, we don't love our children any less because they spill the milk. Their mistakes did not diminish our love for them. Amen? And you can't do anything. Merry Christmas to you this morning. You can't do anything to make God love you any less. Oh, just get all mad. Get in a, a, a tizzy and, and, and do something just as bad as you can think. And No, don't do it, but... But that's, uh, you got to have that in you that, hey, God loves me, period. That's unconditional love. So listen to me, hear me. You'll never do anything to cause God to love you any less or any more than he already loves you. But you can sure please him or disappoint him. It's a difference. It's a difference. Peace. Glory to God. Back up a little bit. There's another scripture I wanted to read. I think it's in Thessalonians. Man, got some notes somewhere. I'll stay tuned. I want to point out a couple of more. But next week, I really am going to talk more about the peace itself and what it is. And by the way, Liz and Emily didn't know I was going to preach on this, but uh, if you're on Facebook and you're a friend of Emily's, just read her post, and then you don't have to come to service next week. No, 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 don't do that. But do read her post, and, and it's about the peace of God. What is the peace of God? You know, you don't have God's peace because... Turn this uh, monitor off uh, back here, the base... Or all the monitors on my channel are, please, sir. No monitors. Thank you, thank you. But we don't have peace because of an, even an absence of difficulties, do we? Right? Now, my peace is not dictated by good circumstances. I have peace because I have a, a person. I have peace because I have Christ. In the midst of the storm, I have peace. When things are going good, I have peace. When things are a struggle, I have peace. Why? Because there's a peace that passeth all understanding, and it comes because we're looking into his eyes, and he's telling us, just calm down. As Alice said, don't be afraid. I'm here, and you can trust me. Peace. Jesus had a testimony, John 8, 29. For I do always those things that please him. <laughs> How many of you can say that this morning? Keep, don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. Don't lie in church right now, please. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, none of us 
do always because Christ is a sinless one. And looking through here, I don't, don't think I see any sinless people in here. Well, if you're here, why are you here? No, no. dismiss all the sinless. You may, you may go now. No. But Jesus had that testimony. Woo, I do always those things that please him. You know what our testimony needs to be? More and more. He's working in me. Amen. He's working in me, and I'm becoming more like him. God wants us to work. Hebrews chapter 13. Turn there with me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, I think we're verse 20 and 21. Hebrews chapter 13. Those two verses. Chapter, verse 20 and verse 21. Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, give you a minute there to find that. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, there he is, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, keep that in mind as we take communion here in a minute, Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Can I hear an amen? So he is working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. 2 Timothy 2, 4 talks about our goal, no man that warth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath called him. See, our goal is to please God. Listen to me. There's nobody got a testimony that I always do those things that please him. Sometimes we disappoint our Heavenly Father, just like you disappointed your earthly father, just like our children disappointed us from time to time. But that didn't diminish our love for him because their goal was... And the process was, God is working in us what is pleasing to him. And the scripture also says that he that began a good work in us, he's going to do one. He's going to perfect it. He's going to bring it to completion. We are becoming, that's our testimony. I am submitted to God, and by his spirit, he is working in me that which is pleasing to him. Amen? That's your testimony. What's your testimony? That I've always pleased him? No. That I'm never going to make a mistake? No. But I am submitted to God, and I'm allowing him to work in me. That means he is changing me. That means he is getting the rough edges off. That means he is uh, transforming my life. That means the fruit of the Spirit is becoming more evident in my life. Amen? That means I'm growing in love, as the Scripture says. I'm growing in the things of God. He's working in me. So how do you get God's more of his favor and please him? We read 1 John 3, 22. We receive from him because we, what we ask of him because we obey his commands and do what pleases. Do you see how important obedience is? I want to stress that this morning. And there's a lot of teaching, a lot of things going on and about the grace of God. And I want to talk about that more here at the, at the beginning of the year. Just a lot being said and talked about the grace of God. I, I love to, to read. I got started looking at some books and, and I've got a stack about that. You know what? It's just on the grace of God. And there's just all kind of teaching out there and doctrine. And some of them I think are not correct. And, and I, want, I want to talk about those. Uh, on, on one side of the pendulum, because of the grace of God, you just live any way you want to. God's got it covered. Okay, it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. You are forgiven already. You never have to ask again. Got you covered. God's grace. There's some truth in that. Let me know God's got us covered. 
and God's already forgiven us, it's finished. The work is finished. See? Then there's another deal that basically if you ever make a mistake that you've lost your salvation and you got to get saved again and you've fallen from grace. That's error too. Amen? And this grace, I think, is, is really a, a misunderstood thing today. And, and because I think early in the church, what I think we've done is overcorrected. The church was really legalistic a few years back. And I mean, what, everything was just very legalistic. Okay? And many times when you correct, just like in a car, sometimes you're going the wrong way, and you overcorrect, you can do some damage. And I think to a degree, there's been some overcorrection. I'm a firm proponent of the grace of God and the undeserved, unmerited favor of the grace of God. And I can frustrate that grace, though, by just using it as a license to live any way that I want to and thinking it doesn't matter. God is gracious. But as we see the Word of God, how we live matters. Whether you obey or not, matters you see in fact it's the grace of god that teaches us you know the scripture said to live godly lives teaches us that denying ungodliness that we should live righteously and soberly in this present world and so that is the practical righteousness that we mentioned a while ago that we should live righteously. How do we do that? We allow him to work in us that which is well-pleasing to him. We stay on the potter's wheel and let him mold us and shape us and change us, form us, fashion us into his likeness and into his image. What's your testimony this morning? I can tell you that it's not that I've always done those things that are, I do always those things that please him. That was Jesus' testimony. That's our Savior. That's our Redeemer. That's the sinless one. But I believe we can have a testimony, even as Enoch did. Scripture says that he walked with God, and God was pleased with him. That's how we, our testimony. I'm walking with God. And he is pleased with me because I'm asking for his forgiveness when I make a mistake. Amen. When I sin, I confess my sin and he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is pleased with that. You see, God doesn't get, he's, when you sin, he's like Emily or Lucy. Just calm down. It's okay. Okay. God forgive me. See, that's pleasing to God. It doesn't dis, what displeases God is if you live in rebellion to him. And yeah, I'm just going to do my own thing and snub God in the face and just live my own life. No, I'm allowing God to work in me that which is well-pleasing to him. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, the scripture tells us there, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, Live the kind of life, he's saying, that really that proves that God has called you. You see, we can look at somebody's life. How I many know oh, the fruit tells a story? Mm -hmm. And our fruit ought to be, a testimony ought to be, that person loves God. Amen? How I many know oh, we ought to be, our lives ought to be a testimony to how good and how great God is and how his power to change our life. We have to get over this mentality that, well, I'm just a human being. I can't help my temper. I'm going to get mad. I just can't forgive that person. That's just who I am. That's just the way I even heard people say, that's the way God made me. No, that's the way the fallen nature made you. No, God restores you and fills you with his love so that you can forgive, so that you can love not just your friends but your enemies. And so we have to realize that God has called us as righteousness of God to live 
righteous lives and to allow him to work in us that which is pleasing to him and to walk in a, a way that is worthy of the Lord, to lead a life, to live the kind of life that actually proves God has called us. <clears throat> Colossians 1.10, again, you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Again, in 1 Thessalonians 2.12, we exhort you. We comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you walk worthy of God who had called you. Philippians 1.27 uh, calls us to, to behave. Uh, only let your conversation or uh, your way of life, your manner of life, be as becometh the gospel. Live in such a way that people know we love God. Isn't that good? Doesn't mean you're never going to make a mistake. I don't believe the world is looking for perfect people. I mean, I think they're smart enough to know that, that uh, Christians aren't perfect. Now, and we, hopefully we don't give them the idea that we think we are. Now, therein lies some problems, right? You go around acting like you're more holy and, 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 and all, and, you know, that's very demonic, by the way. But I believe the world... If we live and allow God to work his righteousness in us and work that which is well-pleasing to him in us. Live worthy. That just simply means appropriately, suitable, agreeable, compatible. It fits. This is how God wants us to live. Last scripture, look in Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. I want somebody to read that for me. I don't, I don't have it up here. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Good Christmas verse to close with this morning. Somebody else read it in another ver version, another. Yeah. I want to point this scripture out because sometimes we, you know, how am I going to please God? What, oh, this is so, oh, what am I going to do? Hey, listen, do good. <laughs> Aren't you glad? God made it simple. I really want to boil this down here and listen to how simple this is. Someone else read it. A third time's a charm. Amen. Somebody else read it loud and clear. Must be the message Bible. As we celebrate his birth, I think this verse really just do good and communicate. The word communicate literally means share. Christmas time. Good time to share. I'm going to brag on our wonderful church people. Again, in Center Bolton, but again, thanks for your generosity. This Thanksgiving Christmas season, your giving allowed us to buy Thanksgiving meals for 12 families. We had church members. It says eight here. Uh, since then, I know we've had four additional families adopted. Uh, about another five children, maybe six. I'm not sure about one family. So make that about 14, 15 children 
that gifts have been bought for this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. They had a party over here, and uh, grace teams were involved in it, and uh, identified some, some children, and, and uh, bought them dolls, the girls' dolls. What did what'd you buy the guys? Okay, guy stuff, girls got girl stuff, guys got guy stuff. And uh, Martha made things to put the dolls in. And Yes, ma'am. Good. Oh, good. I don't know. Jonathan might have that on the screen before we leave. I don't know. Hey. I don't know, but. See, that's right. Yeah, Peyton had a has a new sister. Uh -huh. And say, what I want to do? We talk about pleasing. What pleases God? Doing good, sharing. This isn't rocket science. This is real simple. In the office, we go. We had people call, and isn't it blessed? Isn't it good to give, Stacy? See, what God wants us to do is to do what he did. Went about doing good. You see, it's, it's easy. Let's do good. That's what Jesus did. He went about doing good and healing all that were is that six, 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 oppressed of the devil. And so, again, people are looking for peace. There's so much oppression. There's so much tragedy. And there's so much turmoil. And there's so much difficulties. And God says here, I want you to be instruments. My hands and my feet. And I want you to go out these walls and do good and share. <laughs> do you hear what we're saying? Christmas, we still have time. Jack gave us some, we had an elder party uh, last week. And, and uh, started to see Jolene's house, but it's Tim and Jolene's house. And uh, they blessed us with gifts, and they gave us other things to bless other people with. I'm, I'm telling you, as we begin to think about the new year coming up, I'm just thinking, God, how can we be a bigger blessing? It's, what more good can we do? I, I just, I think we just make it too hard sometimes. Do y'all hear my heart this morning? So we still have time to do good. We still have time to... Go do something for other people. I guarantee you, you make it about other people, you'll have a good Christmas. You make it all about yourself, you will wake up Saturday morning, you think, is that it? Is it? And then you're just in debt? And you ain't, there's no fulfillment? There's no fulfillment in selfishness. That's okay to buy our family gifts, okay? If, you're buying others. Communicate to other people. It is selfish if it's just us and no more. See, that's, that's a lesson we've got to learn. But we can do good for us and for our family. And we can do good and communicate and share with other people. I'm going to challenge you today. As the ushers come to get the offering. Yes, Brother Jack. Ushers, come, please. Mm -hmm. That's right. 